Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get our complimentary newsletter at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. These are tough times and they're getting even tougher. The clock is ticking. The countdown to collapse is well underway. What are you going to do about it? Will you just wait for it to happen or will you be ready when it happens? The decision is yours and yours alone. Join myself, Mickey Fulp, Robert Ian, David Morgan, Jeff Berwick, Elijah Johnson, Alan Butler, Gregory Manorino, Daniel Amaduri, Andy Hoffman, Tacoa De Silva, Trace Mayer, one of the world's leading Bitcoin authorities, Bix Weir, Jay Taylor, and Gary Christensen at the Liberty Mastermind Symposium in Las Vegas on February 21st and 22nd and learn how to create your plan to survive the collapse. The last Liberty Mastermind Symposium was one of the most highly rated conferences ever, and this one promises to be even better. Don't miss it. Join us and register now at libertymastermind.us. US. LibertyMastermind.us. This one is going to be out of this world and it's going to be even better because it's in Las Vegas, Nevada. Go to Liberty Mastermind US and sign up today. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network.com. I'm Kerry Lutz on 1230 WBZT. Well, you don't hear from him much on the media, he isn't interviewed that much. But you should hear from him. His name is Ned Schmidt, uncanny forecaster, especially when it comes to gold and silver and the commodities. Been writing the Value View report for many, many years dealing with gold and commodities. Ned, welcome back to the Financial Survival Network. Hi, it's great to be here. How are you today? Hey, well, always good to talk to you. You know that. And... Hey, we've had this bear market in the precious metals for the past couple of years. Certainly the uh, Chinese, the Asians, have not been dissuaded by it, have they? No, no. The the Chinese are are continuing to be big buyers. And they've been buying. They're buying now, and they bought last month, uh, in anticipation of their new year, which comes in the January. I think we're going to see the, the transfers into China set fantastic records, November, December, because they're going to be buying a lot of gold for for their New Year, which is in late January. It's a big holiday, and and and, and they're they're having a good year. They're not slugging along in the mud like the U.S. economy. Yeah, why do you think that is, huh? Well. You know, the real difference is really very simple, and, and Hayek pointed it out, and it's ignored by all Keynesians, is I, I get a magazine, an e-magazine from uh, China, and they also have a website. It's C-A-I-X-I-N dot com. But in their magazine, the first thing they report is all the regulatory changes in China. They are, it's become a national pastime in China to eliminate government regulations. They are shrinking the number of government regulations in that country. Now, being yourself to Washington, D.C., the Mr. Uh, bureaucracy in the White House. I mean, they can't print the Federal Register fast enough to include all the regulatory changes. We are increasing regulations, and the EU isn't any better. So here we have two giant governments that are making things and life and business more miserable for their citizens, where in the, in the communist nation, well, we're really soon we're going to call them the Chamber of Commerce in China, is reducing regulations. It's, a, it's a, incredible. That explains the difference in the growth. And when you've got a burdensome government, like we have now in Washington, to look for an acceleration in economic growth like many are doing next year is just nonsense. I mean, we're going in to January in bad shape. 
Thanksgiving holiday sales were down. The last third quarter GDP number, consumer spending growth rate was reduced to about one and a half percent. And we roll into January, and Obamacare hits in full, oh, like a hat, man with a hatchet in both hands. And we're going to see the U.S. economy sink. I think we'll be lucky to have positive growth in the United States next year. Okay. Well, that's also assuming that uh, you believe any of the statistics, Ned, that are that are being produced by uh, by this regime. Can you believe oh, anything I, they say? I, I don't believe believe the labor numbers, and I mean Jack Welsh was proved right. If there was <laughs> any man that was right, Jack Welsh was the one. And you can't believe any of the labor numbers. I think they're just. Whatever whatever they are told by the White House to make the numbers is what they're going to be. Yeah, it's a Alice in Wonderland, pie in the sky numbers, right? Right. right. I mean, and, and one of the implications of all this is that if we go into a weak economy again next year, and with the poll numbers for the president and the Democratic Party just in the basement, we cannot expect a democratically appointed Federal Reserve chairman to start a big taper program. They're going to be the committee to support the president's party next year. So odds are we get no taper next week, maybe maybe a Twix in January. But But if you look at what the medals have done, gold and silver during this, this paper discussion. It's a sell on the rumor, buy on the news story. Uh, it just clearly is. It's, it's fully discounted in gold and silver. Yeah, and in fact, uh, what Peter Schiff said, and I tend to agree with him, is not only, um, not only are they not going to taper, but they're actually going to increase the the amount that they're printing. You agree with that? Uh, I don't know if they, I, I don't know if they do, would do that. I I certainly wouldn't discount the possibility. Not perhaps at the January meeting, but at the meeting after that. I don't know if there's a February meeting or not. Okay. Uh, would anything surprise you? Would anything surprise you at this point? No. Uh, Nothing that was nothing that supports the president's regime and the dictatorship of Harry Reid surprises me any more at all. Yeah, how could it really think about it? Now we bring all that in to this gold and silver bear market. I mean, this gold bear market has gray hair. Its teeth are falling out. Its joints hurt. And its eyes got cataracts. And and we need to realize that this bear is old. And when a bear is old, he finally goes to the big bear place in the sky. And a new market develops. And we had a major bottom in June, which still has not been broken. We had the typical October low that happens periodically in markets. That's the month that the funds book their losses, the offset gains that they're going to pass out to investors. So we had a low in October, which is not unusual in, say, mutual funds that have had a bad year. Now, we've had this second sell-off through last week that hit 12.18. That is the... Uh, year-end liquidation that often occurs in the futures markets. If you look at what happens in thanks, uh, the week before Thanksgiving to about the week or two after, uh, the institutions start winding down positions. Uh, I mean, nobody in Wall Street works after Friday till the first of the new year. God forbid. And so, yeah, I mean, they, they, so they close their position. You've seen a, about a 60,000 contract 
shrinkage in their net, net long position. So that low of last week, 1218, was probably the final test of the June low. So if you're sitting around waiting for 1060 because of some technician's charts, you're going to miss the train. You know, you might as well turn your ticket in now and, and just stay home because the game is going to start again. And that base is, is from end of June through last week, that's over five-month-long base. That's a long base. Now, it's not, it wouldn't be, it would be conceivable that a base <laughs> could take eight months or more. But, I mean, this one's been so brutal this year, I don't think it's going to. I think we've seen the lows. Uh, we've seen the pest of the lows. And we can look forward to everything the U.S. government's going to do that makes a dollar worthless and, and go more valuable. Yeah, it makes total sense, huh? Right. And it's interesting on the gold stocks that, that the internals on the gold stocks are really looking better. They're not, it's not time to ring a bell and jump on the parse and start chasing gold stocks. But we had a low in the gold stock, but using the, the GDX or the GDXJ, which are the two ETFs of gold stocks. They made a low in June. But then recently they made another low with end of year selling. So we've, we've recently made another low in those two mutual funds. But, and this is a big but to technicians, is the number of net new lows has been shrinking. That was in a bear market like we've been in. The number of new 52 week lows is going to be a bit higher than the number of new 52 week highs. So in June, like 100% of them, I mean 98% of gold stocks made new 52 week lows. This past week, when the, when the indices made new lows, it was only about, uh, 60% made new lows. So the internals are improving. What we need for the gold stocks is to not see their revenue shrinking anymore. And that won't happen until sometime in the first of the year. But if you and you haven't sold your gold stocks, don't sell them now. Right. Seems seems like it's pretty much hit bottom. I, I do. And now one one strategy for the more adventuresome. Uh you know, this is you know instead of going to Las Vegas this year, take the take Take the GD, the GD list of holdings for the GDX, the gold stock ETF, and every, and buy some of all of them that are selling for under $10. Or if you want to be even more critical, buy some of all those selling for under $5. And, and I, I think a year from now, you could afford a better trip to Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, you can be staying in the Bellagio or the Wynn instead of, yep. the, instead of the Treasure Island, huh? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting what you say, that the Chinese are cutting regulation. You know what this is reminiscent of, uh, Ned? And when uh, Warren Harding was president in 1920 and 21. And the I don't remember that. I'm sorry. Um, I don't either. I only know uh, the history books and the <laughs> Great Depression of 1921 that never occurred. Because what did he do when uh, when the economy contracted worse than it did in 1929? They didn't raise taxes. They didn't do a bunch of government programs. They cut government spending by 50 percent. They cut back on taxes. And you know what happened? And they cut back on regulation. Miracle of all miracles, the depression never occurred. And that's what the Chinese are doing. They're looking back at American history and learning from it. That's right. That's right. They they they, they are an incredible people for looking at history and studying it 
before they move. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a book on naval, the history of naval tactics that was written in, oh, 1903 or something like that. This was the book that the Chinese Navy leaders read 10 years ago to plan their expansion of their Navy. That's, that's how thorough they are. Amazing. And, uh, it, it, you know, we're not going to learn. We haven't learned the lesson yet. We're going to have to relearn it, I'm afraid. Yep. I just find that incredible that they're decreasing regulation, which is what the United States should be doing. And we're going to... They, yep. they, have, they have opened a new free trade zone in China. Is it in Shenzhen or Shanghai or whatever? Traditionally, the Chinese government puts out a list of positive things. Foreign entities may do A, B, C, D. When they open this new free, free trade zone, they instead issued a negative list, a list of things that foreign corporations cannot do. You can do everything else. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest complaint has been, not from, from the foreign companies, but from the Chinese, that the negative list is too long. <laughs> so they're going to cut it in half. Huh. They're go you know, we, we are still in the mentality in the United States where we have a positive list. You can do that or this or that. Chinese attitude now is shifting. There are a few things we don't want you to do, but you can do everything else. And, and that's, a, that's a clear, different mindset. I think that's what they call free enterprise. Yeah, kind of like the uh, Constitution being a limit on what the uh, government, you know, a constraint on that, government you know, power. But the, that, that thing doesn't apply to our current regime. No. No, it was, they're it was exempt. It was, it, was, it was repealed upon Obama's inauguration. I think you're right about that. And we're going to talk more about what's coming up uh, for commodities the economy, and Obamacare up next on the Financial Survival Network on 1230 WBZT. Hi, it's Kerry Lutz. I recently decided to move my retirement account into physical precious metals to hedge against the coming times. If you want to move an existing retirement account into physical precious metals that you can hold in your hand tax-free, there's no company that can do it more quickly and efficiently than Regal Assets. It took them just 24 hours to open my new IRA account, and all I had to do was fill out one simple form. The best part is that Regal Assets does all the work for you. They cover the setup and administrative costs for 2013. If you're interested in making the same move I did, call 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, that's 855-678-6620, or visit them at regalassets.com. You'll be glad you did, and tell them Kerry sent you. And we're back with Ned Schmidt. I'm Kerry Lutz on the Financial Survival Network dot com. So, Ned, what's coming up with uh, the commodities and uh, you know the ags, particularly the grains, the meats, you know, for 2014? In your opinion? Well, right now where we're at, we got to remember it's it's winter in the northern hemisphere, and so the ag sector kind of is shutting down right now. But right now, and it's going to continue into the first of the year, the non-grains, anything that's not a grain, is, is very strong. I mean, beef prices, uh, people have finally just given up and said beef prices are going higher next spring. We're not going to see an increase. We're not going to see a bottom in U.S. beef production until sometime... March or April at the earliest. And so uh, beef prices are just bobbling around the highs. They're not going to go down. There's just no cattle behind them. And so anything 
that's non-grain, cotton is put in a, in a trading range, it's going to break out of sugar, palm oil. Now, the grains are all at the bottom of relative strength. And what that means is, when prices are weak in, in a commodity like agriculture, that has a real-world impact. In other words, if the price of Apple stock goes to 1000 it has no impact on the number of iPhones that are produced. If the price of a bushel of corn goes to four and a quarter, it does have an impact. So the grains are going to move laterally until maybe the first week in March, because that's when the trade starts estimating how many acres of corn and soybeans we're going to plant in the United States. And we're going to see a dramatic drop in corn planting this coming year. Uh, in fact, it may be a record drop in corn plantings this year. So we're probably going to see corn prices higher a year from now, soybean prices a little weaker, because we're going to plant a lot of soybeans this coming year. But this is important to put in perspective, that this is... We've already hit the low in corn. The low in corn was the second week in October. Is that this is the second low in over 10 years where the low in corn prices is higher than the previous low. Mm -hmm. So, so what you've got is, is we hit a low of three something, low threes a few years ago. The, the sec, the next low is, was four and a quarter. And so we're going higher. Now, it may not be this week or next month, but the days of cheap food are over. Um, so we got, have we got a few minutes yet? Oh, we've got plenty of time. We're going to keep going, Ned, because normally I have to, uh, for time constraints, have to uh, cut our time back, but we're going to keep going here. So okay. keep giving us I, your, I wanna, your predictions here. Your I want to talk one minute. One minute about the change in the one child policy in China. Yeah, that is a major, major trend that most of you don't really understand the effect that it's going to have, especially in demand for food in the coming years. Oh, it's dramatic. I mean, yeah, and correctly so, the journalists all write stories from ag experts that it won't change the number of. Children that women have, no, it won't immediately. 1.2 children for a woman in a childbearing age. But at the margin, it's incredible. Just think about it. And, and one of the ways to estimate something is just just to kind of estimate it. We have, we've got 1.3 billion Chinese. And let's say half of them are married. That's 650 million, right? Half of them, if half of them were in childbearing age, that's 325 million women that could have babies. And let's just say a quarter of them have babies in the next years, two, three. That is what? 80, 80 million babies being born. That's a lot of pampers. And that's two. Canada's. Mm -hmm. Canada's population is 35 to 36 million people. That's two Canada's. And you know the funny thing about babies and people? They eat every day the rest of their lives. And, and the impact of the world creating two Canada's that can afford to eat that's the difference. The Chinese population can afford to eat. And so, I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking, I never saw anybody, just an industry, just lock in the next 10 years. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, as good, it's, it's, it's as good as housing was 20 years ago, the banking industry 10 years ago. Uh, the Internet was 20-some years ago. You know, it's an industry for the first, it's one of the few industries you look around that there is a lock on the future that cannot be avoided. The population's incomes 
are growing faster than the world's ability to grow food. And, and as long as m more dollars are chasing food than as food is expanding, prices can only go up. And uh, uh, it's an industry that people just simply have, if they own equities, they simply have to be exposed to. And there's a shortage of, uh, of producers out there. The uh, average farmer, what's the age of the average farmer in the U.S.? 57, I think it is. Oh, I would think so, yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, the thing with farmers is they stay on the farm and they retire on the, you know, retirement of them is when the sun comes and takes part of the work. <laughs> you know, and that's, that they keep working. So, you know, basically a farmer retires when he falls over. And, and, and increasingly, the ownership of farms is shifting to women. And they tend to live longer than the husbands. So that, you know, so it's interesting that the farming industry ownership of the land is slowly shifting to women. And I think, I would think in the next 10 years, 10 years from now, the majority of American farmland will be owned by women. That's amazing. Did not know that. Didn't know that. So, uh, there, there, there are two good sectors that investors have to be looking at. I mean, you've got to be looking at the precious metals right now. Uh, it's too early to start jumping on gold stocks, but uh, maybe in, in the spring sometime when the snow's gone. Uh, and then clearly investors, if they own equities, they've got to be taking a look at agriculture. It's just, and, and there's, there's so many things opening up. Uh, one of the, I, I put out some lists where I don't recommend the stocks. I just, informational, because I mean, and some of them are like flipping coin. Uh, we've got one now, Aqua Bounty, on, in London. It's, in the last six months, it's done like added 500%. It has the first approved genetically modified salmon. And in November, they got approved to produce genetically modified salmon by environmental Environment Canada. And that's one half of the approvals they need. With genetically modified organisms, you need two approvals, one to produce it and one to sell it. And, and so there are one... No, go ahead. What's your feeling on the whole GMO debate? Is that legitimate? No. It, 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 there are people that are going to be against any innovation, no matter what it is. And... Uh, didn't they call them Luddites one time? Yeah, we had a discussion about Luddites <laughs> recently. They smashed the cotton mills in uh, yeah. England because they thought uh, the the cotton gin, the cotton mills were going to put them out of work, and you saw how that worked out. Right. So, well, people need to remember that all of our food is genetically modified. The difference is, historically, we've done it the old-fashioned way, by crossbreeding in the field. field. And so the wheat we eat today is not the wheat the pharaohs ate, I assure you. <laughs> so, yeah, Or the emperors. Of, <laughs> yeah, instead of doing it over years, we accelerate it by doing it in, in the laboratory. And there is no venture more tested, more examined. I mean, it's hard to get a drug through the FDA, but a, you can't imagine what an, a genetically modified crop does, has to go through before it's approved. And I don't know what the Europeans are going to eat eventually. Uh, <laughs> cake. They, 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 they're going to eat cake. <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly it. You know, they're not going to produce any energy, and they're not going to produce any food. They're just going to live, you know, I guess I guess if you're a greenie, you start producing chloroform. I don't, not chloroform. <laughs> chlorophyll. <laughs> chlorophyll, right. Maybe they're on chloroform. I don't know. They'll have to chloroform them because they're going to be too hungry to eat uh, chlorophyll. <laughs> you know, and... They used to have that gum, we, remember the chlorophyll gum? Yeah. yeah, that's what the lead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, and then we and 
then we got these crazy labeling laws coming. Mm -hmm. uh, where where the cow was born, <laughs> where it was fed, and where it was slaughtered. Well, we'll have to have a pedigree for the cow, right? Well, yeah, well, somebody's got to keep track of that. Yeah. Well, look, the stuff that they. Trust. I will go There's, for the labeling though for fast food because the stuff yeah. they were putting in the McDonald's hamburgers and other stuff. Like, let's find out what the heck is in there. All right. Well, this is now. Somebody has to keep track of that. You can't trust, you know, the guy says, where did that cow born and raised? Oh, it was in Texas. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> well, you know, you know that, uh, like, Florida is, like, the third uh, biggest cow-raising state in the country, but they don't, there's no cachet to having Florida-raised beef. So they send the cows off to, like, Texas or some other state or Iowa ship them off where then they finish them off and uh, butcher them so they can say they were Iowa cattle, but they actually spent most of their life in Florida. Bizarre thing. So, uh, you know, who knows where these cattle are, but obviously you want real beef in your burger, whatever fast food place you buy it from. That's a different issue than genetically modified but everything is genetically modified to some extent and right. the scientists uh, regardless i've read a lot about it and the gmo thing is uh, a pig and a poke for the most part as long as they're not putting weird chemicals in there antibiotics that's what i object to the antibiotics and the hormones to raise the things much faster so then you get beef that has no taste, Ned. You know, that is oh, yeah, a big yeah, deal. That's a problem. Yeah, modern beef is just... Uh, and the pork is even worse. I mean, what they've done yeah. to pork, they've produced a tasteless white mass. That, uh, so yeah. organic is good. Some of the organically raised stuff tastes... Or grain-fed, free-range, really tastes much Farther, far superior to the stuff that's raised in these lots. Um, yeah. You know, it's just much better. But as far as genetically modified, and, and we need a Steve Jobs of agriculture here to produce more because we're not going to have enough. That is the reality, correct? That's it. I mean, if we don't make some plants and animals more productive, like genetically modified salmon, it, it just won't be enough, and uh, that's a reality. And unfortunately, we are starting to run into some biological limits. And, and you know, a corn, a, a stalk of corn is not going to grow 14 feet tall and have 20 years of corn on it. <laughs> it's, it's not the way God made corn plants, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they, <laughs> and so, so we need to figure out higher density, higher yielding crops. And for the most part, yeah, there are little tricks you can do, uh, you know, to eliminate uh, pests and things like that. But for the most part, it's going to come through science. There really is no other way to do it. And uh, the Luddites are going to have to accept that. Hey, Ned, tell us uh, your two publications, one for precious metals, the other for uh, agricultural commodities. Right. My uh, uh, metal site is valueviewgoldreport.com, valueviewgoldreport.com. And agriculture is agrifoodvalueview.com, agrifoodvalueview.com. And, and it's been fun. Yeah. Hey, always fun with you, Ned. And uh, we will talk with you again real soon. And uh, we'll touch in a little bit more regularly because these markets are definitely heating up. There's no question about it. I wholeheartedly endorse your view that the uh, the gold bear is dying a very unglorious uh, death here and well-deserved. I might add the manipulation, well, that's only going to get you so far. And I think we're at the end of it. Uh, I think they're going to have to give up at some point and... I think this is the year that it's gone, and, you know, we'll see what happens with Bitcoin as well, because... <laughs> yeah, I think 
think that's what I'm going to give El Goya as gifts since you're bitcoins. <laughs> well, they're probably going to wind up not worth the uh, the paper <laughs> or the or the copper and uh, zinc that they're not stamped on, right? <laughs> they're not stamped on. That's correct. Well, you have a happy new year. Hey, you two there in financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Go there, subscribe to the newsletter. We had a great uh, great article on Detroit, which might wind up a new agricultural capital of the United <laughs> States, the way it's going, right? That's right. They're going to plow it under. Yeah, that's probably the best use for that place. And uh, either that or a, uh, a Sino-Chinese uh, uh, colony, one or the other. That's, that's possible. You that's never possible. know. All right, Ned. Talk to you again real soon. All right. Take care. Bye. You be well. Bye. Our friend Tom Dyson at the Palm Beach Letter is giving away free copies of a really cool report he put together called How to Protect Yourself from America's New Secret Police. Inside, you'll learn all sorts of simple, everyday tricks you can use to make yourself a little less visible and vulnerable to scammers, hackers, and even the federal government. For instance, inside Tom's report, you'll learn which free internet email service never to use. This company doesn't care if your account gets hacked or not. Or things the government must tell you if they request your social security number. And how to spot skimmers lying in wait on ATMs and gas pumps and much, much more. These tricks and secrets are low-hanging fruit ideas. You don't have to invest time or much money into them. Most are free. But by taking some basic measures, you can make your privacy much harder to invade than your neighbors. Tom's report is available for a limited time to listeners who take a trial subscription to his newsletter. Just visit the Financial Survival Network homepage for more information or go to www.palmbeachletter2.com. That's www palm beach letter the number two dot com the financial survival network helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy get our complimentary newsletter at financial survival network.com this is the financial survival network